Okay, good morning everybody. My name is Katherine Heilman and I am the Electronic Resources Librarian at UNC Greensboro. Welcome to Stopwatch session number two. Um, unfortunately, one of our speakers um, informed us that he is feeling ill today, um, so he will not be presenting. Uh, I'm going to encourage him to record his session so that you may view it on the virtual week. Um, and we are also missing one of our other speakers, so I have decided to use my um, authority in this capacity to give our speakers a few extra minutes, if they so choose, if they want a couple extra minutes, I'm going to go for it. So I'm not going to be like a hardcore stickler about the time. So um, in interest um, in getting started and keeping time, I'd like to introduce Forrest Link from the College of New Jersey. Um, how many electrons do we need to buy? And you are ready to go. And come on up. Good morning, everyone. Thank, thanks for coming here. Uh, I'm Forrest Link. I'm the acquisition librarian from uh, the College of New Jersey. We're a uh, medium-sized uh, state institution, public institution. We, we like to think of ourselves as a public ivy. Um, so what I wanted to talk about this morning, talk briefly about, is a, a problem I think we, we all have in the course of uh, looking at uh, Purchasing ebooks. This is this is a, a screen I, I took off of, of Gobi. This talks of, this this kind of shows you the the choice that that we often face. What what we're the problem that that has troubled me is at what level of ebook to purchase. Um, we want to on the one hand make sure that we have sufficient coverage for those areas that are much in demand, uh, reserves, things that are, things that are uh, class assignments. On the other hand, we don't want to, to be wasting money by, by buying uh, editions of these, of these e-books that ultimately don't get used or get used very, very little. Um, so what I wanted to do to get a handle on what our usage looks like and what we might want to buy was, I talked to friends at uh, ProQuest and at EBSCO who offer these sorts of models, uh, the multi-user, single-user, unlimited user. And, and folks from both of those companies were very kind to give me very, very detailed reports. I got information on books that we had purchased from January of 2019 up through August of 2022. So this is the data that we, we got. Um, so much of that is fairly self-explanatory. Uh, we got a total of 3,418 ebooks we purchased in that time period. And, and these are the uh, statistics we got. One of the, one of the fundamental problems that I had in, in making some decisions here is what exactly is a use of an ebook? Now, now there's several ways that, that these uh, aggregators have looked at it. You print a page, you, uh, you download a chapter. I decided to go to, to really the broadest measure, which is someone has opened this book. Uh, that, that gave me the, the biggest data set, frankly, and, and, and also, in a way, the cleanest data set. So, so that's, what, that's what I mean by use here. Someone has actually opened a title. Now, the, the important piece of, of data right there is the one that I circled, uh, and this is talking about turnaways. Um, when you buy a single user ebook, you always have to be concerned about turnaways and, and make some decisions about what what does that really mean to you? How much can you how much can you uh, tolerate in terms of turnaways? This problem has gotten in a way to be less of a problem over time because the aggregators now allow you to upgrade these books and we are able to get fulfillment literally within minutes on many of these things. So turnaways have meant less and less. What this, what this really means, though, that this 3% is 
out of that over 2,000 titles that we had purchased, 3% of those titles had a turnaway. I mean, this is, this is sort of a vanishingly small number. And, and the ones that we did have turnaways, we actually upgraded many of those later. So that, that kind of brings me to, to what I was trying to figure out to begin with, is to, is to establish more or less a decision tree for, for when we're selecting these ebooks and what um, access model to go with. So it's actually very simple. If, um, if we're buying a, a standard firm order, in almost every case, just, just buy the single user, or because sometimes, and, and I'm sure you've all seen this, the pricing on ebooks can be, can be interesting. You will see. I, I've seen many times that the single user price is the same as, as maybe a three user price or even an unlimited edition. So I qualified that by saying it, in most cases it makes sense to, to buy the single user or the, most, the, the one with the most uses at, at the lowest price. And I think that's the best use of our money in, in, buying, in buying these ebooks. The other side of this is a, is a decision tree based on whether it's, uh, if, if it's for reserve or for a class assignment, in which case you really are anticipating multi-users perhaps at the same time and, and you really want to avoid the turnaways. If, um, if you don't need DRM free, if you can get the non-linear linear concurrent access, which is basically the same thing, the turnaways for those are, again, very, very low. Three uses are practically no turnaways. In, in the previous screen, there's that little asterisk there at 7% at the, uh, the average number of turnaways. That was a three-user book that uh, did not offer an unlimited edition. So the turnaways were inevitable on that when it was, when it was in reserve. So that's, that's what that data point was about. And if, if your, the book is on reserve, you want it on reserve, and you need DRM free, people are, people are copying chapters, you're putting it in Canvas or whatever your, your, your system is, that, that's useful for, for that situation. This is just a, a quick example of, of what I'm talking about. You can see there, th this is a decision that, that sometimes we're faced with. The, the surprise there, maybe not the surprise, but the one that, that you gravitate toward is that JSTOR one in, in the middle, where you get unlimited DRM free for the cheapest price. And, and clearly that's, that's the way to go. And just, just one final slide, which is, which is, <laughs> which is amusing, and, and you'll see this. Uh, and, and again, in this, in this one, I have no idea why you would buy the single user. <laughs> so, I think I've gone over my time, and that's it. One, oh, okay. Uh, so, so, yeah, that's, um, as I say, that's where, uh, that's how, how we made, that's the uh, decision tree I came up with. Okay, thank you all. Hello, I am Brian Gray, the Collection Strategies Librarian at the Calvin Smith Library at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. Today I'll talk about a new committee we formed and some other projects we're working on to approach collection management in a different way. First, we had a lot of challenges we wanted to overcome. First, we wanted to bring more voices and views into the conversation so that more staff are informed on what's happening and also can provide feedback into our collection efforts. We also needed to revitalize our collection development effort, efforts that have been hampered over the last several years due to COVID. We want to improve communication internally within the library, but also externally with our users. And we wanted to approach collections in a more holistic approach. For example, is the general collections supporting the research needs that are happening in special collections is one of the tasks we'll be looking at. We also want to prepare new colleagues in collection conversations. As we approach uh, filling some opening positions, we hope that some people will be able to take on uh, new roles within the library 
and this these efforts we are undergoing right now might prepare people to to think about having interest in these collection management positions that will be upcoming. First, we we created this collection strategy steering committee. Uh, this was made up with representation from out the throughout the library, including uh, library leadership, uh, uh, such as finance and marketing, uh, acquisitions and technical services, as well as membership from special collections, archives, and a lot of other areas throughout the library. It also includes representation of the librarians that were originally making the decisions, which were the research engagement librarians that focused on the circulating collections. We picked three because one will represent arts and humanities, one will represent social sciences, and one will represent science and engineering. They'll serve in sort of a liaison role to their teams on this committee, and also uh, will pull in other expertise as needed. Some of the early efforts and uh, roles of this committee include inventorying all collection policies and procedures, well, which I'll talk about more in a second, uh, brainstorming different projects and initiatives, guiding library leadership in things like budget preparation, user relationships, and marketing efforts. And we'll have some special projects, such as if we have to make cuts due to budget, if we have extra money to spend, or large-scale weeding projects. We'll also use this committee to guide and prepare a, a communication strategy with our library colleagues to make, pe make people aware of how collection decisions are being made. One of the first efforts this, this committee undertook this year was to gather all the information about collections. You used to have to know which person or team managed the part of the collection process you were interested in to find the information. It could live in a Google Drive, a Google Doc, a Google Site, Box, and a lot of other efforts, you know, a lot of other platforms the university made available to us. This committee got, gathered all the policies and procedures, the assessment data, vendor proposals, best practices, historical decisions, and a lot of other information, and now houses it on one single live guide available to all the library staff. It will link out to wherever those other places are, those teams maintain the information, and also have background information about which team maintains it, how current is the information, and how to gain access if you don't have access. It is also now organized by tasks, such as acquiring new information, assessing inf resources we already have, maybe um, there's a, a task for withdrawing or canceling a subscription, so standard um, tasks you might undertake as you maintain collections. The area this team will work on going forward is to develop a public-facing collection principle statement. A few years ago when the library website was redesigned, most many of our informational um, guidance for users about collections was removed and we need to bring some of that back, but it also needs to be refreshed anyways. This will not be a traditional collection policy, but to describe why we make decisions and how we make decisions. So what factors are we considering such as E, versus print or costs, what do we value in our collections, statements about diversity, accessibility, things like that will be included. And we'll also uh, point out things that we are committed to, such as our external consortia like OhioLink. This group will also be revitalizing our assessment efforts, including um, which things should we be spending efforts on in assessing and how we'll be sharing that with the librarians and staff. We also recently acquired green glass for a large scale weeding project and maybe possible print to e conversion. This group will be guiding the policies and procedures that other teams will be using. Finally, the most recent effort this group talked about was how to help market these collections. So now we'll be providing a monthly idea list to those in the library that manage the library website and social media and other means of marketing uh, to target specific collections and resources. Through that, we will also be providing a training seminar series for the rest of the staff to understand what decisions are being made, how those processes happen throughout the year, and that will allow other people to be involved in the conversations and marketing within their roles. But it also might prepare staff that will consider collection management positions in the future as they may become open, and so that they may be able to consider internal promotion or internal uh, application to a new position. Thank you, and I look forward to the questions uh, proceeding and any follow up that pe people may reach out to me as needed. Thank you. I see it now that it's ready for my place. Hey, there we go. Hey. Good morning, everyone. Morning. I'm Jerry Renna. 
Hi, good morning. My name is Paul Gallagher. I'm the Associate Dean for Resources and Digital Strategies at Western Michigan University. My colleague is also with Western Michigan University. I'm the Collection Strategist Librarian. Now we're here this morning to talk to you about carving up the castle, some of the lessons we learned from high percentage acquisitions cuts. So let me start off with our story. Um, anyone here of COVID-19? <laughs> Um, of course, during this window, we saw many of the same challenges that I think all of you did, if not many. Um, a campus closure, a fiscal contraction, a 20% reduction to acquisitions, and a 24% to general funds. So obviously a significant change. Um, and one of the challenges as we moved into the uh, uh, reduction of the scale was that we have very low numbers of low-use titles and this is really the result of a, a large review that was done in 2017 where, in our words, we kept saying over and over, there's no fat to cut. It's a very healthy, monitored collection. Now, during that same window of time, it's also you know, adjusting to remote work, pandemic conditions, uh, and we moved and closed two branch locations. Uh, and so all this sort of points us to the next, uh, my then collection strategist, the deer in the headlights looking at us saying, uh, this type of work isn't going to be possible, uh, to which we dropped in, oh, by the way, we've got two months, uh, let's go ahead and let's move ahead with this. Yes. What do we do, Jerry? So as Paul said, uh, we, we had a, a collection strategist that had been in uh, the libraries for many years, and she had planned on retiring at the end of the fiscal year 2020, well before the pandemic hit. Um, luckily, she, you know, had to stay for that last two months, uh, and, uh, you know, we got to work together, and I learned a tremendous amount from her about collections, uh, about strategizing your collections, because I was the electronic resources librarian prior to that, so I did, like, all the technical kind of things, but didn't really know about, you know, how you would go about managing such a huge collection. So uh, luckily, she, I had her there for two months, and she uh, trained me a lot, and uh, we figured things out. And, and basically, uh, like Paul said, we had a very lean and mean collection at that time, and so there wasn't a lot of low-hanging fruit. So what we did is we canceled things because they were cancelable. Uh, we canceled um, um, some A and I databases. We canceled uh, some uh, databases that had overlap with other databases, and we split our journal packages uh, to retain only the highest use titles. And and we got our budget uh, where it needed to be, and then uh, we're waiting for. Um, some of our long-term commitments to come up so that we could uh, make some wiggle room in our uh, budget going forward to maybe reinstate some things that had been canceled that we had heard feedback about. So how do you communicate this? How do you tell the story to the campus? Um, the first thing I can say, there's no magic bullet to this. Um, it took everything. Uh, email, um, working through our various campus leadership councils, department chairs, departments via liaisons, um, of course a library website, campus newsletters, and at one point I thought somebody was throwing rocks at my window, but that one didn't play out. So um, I think one of the most effective tools that we uh, leveraged very early on though was simply just creating a lib guide of all, everything that was changing and when. And so that way if you were a person on campus, you could see when uh, changes were going to happen, the time frames for them. Um, and in many cases, these were months in the future, so we gave some departments some time to adjust. Um, I think what's interesting to all of you is, you know, what were some of the key concerns? Um, and I think our biggest challenge was we received very light feedback during this window. And of course, we're under pandemic conditions. We have a very stressed out faculty. Um, but that made it more challenging to understand what is the real pain points and what types of things should we consider for reinstatement. Um, and so we're gracious to the campus for that support, but at the same time, it made it a bit more challenging to know um, what, what things we're doing that are going to have the greatest impact. Um, many of the concerns were preferential or tied to things such as citation tools or impact. We had numerous cases where we would sit with individuals and their interest was more, well, I really like using this tool, although we may still have all the content that represents in a different platform. And so there was sort of working through some of the preferential elements with discovery layers. Um, and, and one other concern we saw too is, you know, with this level of cancellation, are we going to see an offload to ILL? 
Um, but we didn't see that shift. As a matter of fact, we saw a general decline of use during that. I think that might speak to the, uh, the research portfolio sh uh, slowing during that window. Um, but the, in a good sense that some of the corrections we made, they weren't just pushed over to ILL. They were finding other pathways into that content. So there was, we do think there was a win there. Yeah, and ILL never, even, even after the, the paywalls went back up for all of the vendors that had opened up their collections during the pandemic, ILL never really uh, ramped back up. But one of the things that, um, that was really uh, g good for our faculty and students was that our dean um, arranged for a one-time injection of funds to sort of spread this million and a half dollar budget cut over two years. And so um, we were hoping, I mean, it was, it was good for the faculty and the students that they didn't lose access to uh, resources once all the paywalls went, went back up. And it was also good for the uh, people working in technical services positions that had to, you know, do all the back end stuff. But um, we were really hoping that that extra time would, pro would give us uh, more faculty feedback about the cancellations because they would have had been able to look at our lib guide and see what the dates were. I mean, it was like a little bit less of a deer in the headlights, but we didn't get that feedback. Um, so that was uh, really interesting. It was something that we were hoping uh, would happen and didn't. So. And so just kind of a last note, what's a couple of the outcomes? Um, one of which was, and this is where our efforts have taken us now, is we've really redesigned, it's given us the opportunity to redesign our fiscal model that we've used. Um, and it, it puts greater reliance on one time and some of our endowment funds, particularly for one time purchases like monographs. Um, but it's not a cautionary sustainability tale as we use some of the revenue those generate to build up a model that can fund for a period of, um, for into the future. So we're excited about that. Yeah, and one of the um, long-term contracts that we had, we um, renegotiated that, and that gave us uh, quite a bit of, of wiggle room, too. So in addition to uh, utilizing the endowment funds, we have a little uh, more uh, ability to bring back things that, are, uh, that, we're, fe that we're hearing about. One of which we'll mention too is that we've really taken a stance where we're, we're uh, really pushing back against apartments for A and I or databases and subscription resources that are built at the index level. Um, and the reason is, is our priority. We want to save content. We want to be able to preserve full text. And so, if uh, an A and I database is really integral to the type of research they do, we want to have that conversation and sort of let them unpack that. Yeah, and uh, one of the uh, databases that was recently reinstated was was the one database that we probably heard the most, most feedback about. about. It was an a &I database, and we just reinstated that. Um, so uh, going forward, you know, um, uh, let me see what I'm gonna say here. Um, I don't know, it's just, it's to, to me, the past two and a half years has been one of tremendous change. Our campus is completely different. Um, we have a new fiscal model on campus. We also have a, a new faculty coming in, and we have all these new teaching modalities. And I feel like we're positioned now um, w with all of the hard work that we did and all of the pain and listening and all that kind of stuff that, that going forward, we'll be able to, to have as a rich, deep, robust collection as, as we did in the before times for this new campus that we are working with now. I think I would just say as a closing note that it was, uh, I wouldn't do it this way again, but I think of some of the outcomes, I think we're more agile and have more uh, capability, so I think we're excited about that. But with that, we'll stop and we'll pause for questions, so. I don't know how much time we've got. Is that less than six minutes? Is Linda here by any chance? She is not, okay. So in the Q&A portion, um, I'm going to come around with this microphone. This is how the people during the virtual week will hear the questions. So please speak into the microphone. And let's pepper our uh, speakers with questions, if you could come up. And then if you would make sure that you answer your questions in the microphone. All right, does anybody have any questions? Thank you um, for both of the presentations. I have a question regarding the budget cuts. Um, in 2017, 
was there a cut that was the catalyst for that overall review? And um, also, were other departments on campus affected, or was it just the library that was mandated for this most recent uh, round of cuts? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Good, sure. There wasn't a, a 2017, a, like a large cut that came through, although uh, to be fair, it predates my time at the university. There was a thought at that time it was more built around an, uh, you know, future anticipation, but it was really a chance just to do a, a good old you know, right sizing of the collection, to look through subscriptions and, and to kind of do that type of audit work. Um, to the larger though, the campus, yes, those were across the board to everybody. So there was nothing specific to the libraries as a result of that. It was it felt in all quarters in the president's office down. So. Hi, to the Western Michigan folks, uh, what A&I database did you read, Steve? Ah, want me to take that? Go ahead. Yeah. Sociological abstracts. Okay. Um, yep. Okay, uh, second, second question. Sure. Why do you think ILL doesn't increase when you do massive cuts? That is a great question, and I, you know, I wish that would be a whole presentation and actually some uh, research I'm doing now. My, my gut tells me, and take this as the anecdotal gut it is, is that I think we just saw a decrease of the research enterprise during that window. The stats we're starting to see this fall, we're starting to see pretty significant rebounds of just about everything. Um, but that is not research driven, that's sort of the best guess of it, but it does seem like everything was quieter for a period of years, and that's all changing this fall, so. Yeah. Um, we saw a significant reduction in our interlibrary loan over the past couple of years, and I think in part because people weren't on campus. Um, but the, a lot of our interlibrary loan is physical materials. I mean, there, there is an increasing amount that's digital, but if somebody wants a book, um, and, and we saw increased use of um, purchase on demand of ebooks rather than, so I, I think part of it is, is a fallout of the pandemic and that, that also our interlibrary loan still tends to be physical materials. Many also mentioned too, during that window, a lot of paywalls were dropped. So if you look at, you know, during that quarantine <clears throat> period, you may get skewed, skewed results as well. So for the ebook uh, question, are you also trying out PDA or any of evidence-based, any of the other models? Not that that'll make a difference in how many concurrent users, but it kind of how are your requests coming in? Um, we are we we are not exactly a cutting edge library. <laughs> <laughs> so so. We, we do not have PDA. We're, we're just kind of talking about it now, and I think some of the, the results of, of this work here will, will push us in that direction. I have a question that I haven't fully articulated, but it was about the reliance on one-time and endowment funds. I found that, you know, in any given year that, that that's great, but over time, do you, is it really a balanced way to build a collection, especially in regard to the more STEM-related fields that really want databases yeah. and subscription access? You want me to take home? Yeah. yeah. Um, I would think it would depend on when you said you were using them, what you meant. I think if it was a matter of, like, let's say, taking monographic purchases and putting them into one-time funds that would run out, that would generate a concern for me, because that sort of says, we're going to keep our subscription money in STEM databases where the big money goes, and then we're going to support humanities until we're broke. And that's sort of not, I mean, obviously not we'd want to go. Um, in our particular case, though, it's looking at the revenue they generate. So it is a constant stream. Now, there is risk there because they do fluctuate, but in our case, we think it's sufficient to support our monographic purchases and things like that over... Um, you know, for you know, into the future in a sustainable model. So I, I think you're right. I think in our case it would make a lot of sense. But I think without that, if it was like a gift that was going to run out, that would be a little different and would take a, a bit more concern in thinking how you want to manage that longer term. Do we have any more questions? Well, thank you for coming today. This is a shortened session due to circumstances, but um, enjoy the rest of your day. And if you would like to contact our speakers with further questions, please do so.